Okay, so where does all that sun energy at the top of Earth's atmosphere go? We talk about radiative transfer as relating to the mathematics and the physics behind the propagation of electromagnetic radiation through the atmosphere and the interaction of that radiation with the atmospheric constituents, land and ocean surfaces. And there are four main processes we'll be considering. The scattering, reflection, absorption and emission. The first two, scattering and reflection, really are about the deflection of the radiation from its direct path. So uh, they are, um, th there are differences defining scattering and reflection. We'll talk about those in a minute. But they differ from the absorption and emission, whereas because absorption and emission relate to the change in the uh, energy content um, of molecules. Uh, as a molecule might absorb radiation, uh, it rises to a higher energy state. As it drops from that higher energy state, it will emit radiation. So the absorption and emission um, happens through the, um, the absorption and then eventual re-emission of the radiation, whereas scattering and reflection uh, deflect the motion of the electromagnetic radiation through the atmosphere. Um, we talk about direct beam of solar irradiance. So here's a depiction of that uh, top of atmosphere solar irradiance. Now remember, it's, all, it's a function of wavelength. Uh, as I said previously, if we integrate the, uh, the solar spectral irradiance under the black body curve, we'll get the solar constant about 1365 watts per square meter. But it is a function of wavelength, and that'll become clear why we uh, be explicit about that later. But effectively, you've got the uh, direct beam of solar irradiance entering the Earth's top of Earth's atmosphere, and it will reduce by in intensity by a factor of e to the minus tau, where tau is what we call the optical depth. Optical depth is the measure of the cumulative reduction in intensity of that direct beam of radiation. Um, and we can think about uh, the transmission through the atmosphere as being e to the power of minus tau. Um, therefore, one minus the transmissivity is what we would call the absorption of the atmosphere. So if it's not transmitting through the atmosphere, it's being absorbed by the atmosphere. And um, so we can write that explicitly as one minus e to the power of uh, minus tau. And that's what we call Beer-Lambert's law. Um, but we can de decompose scattering, uh, the, the optical depth uh, into the scattering component and the gas ab absorption component. We call the scattering component um, is about the deflection of the direct beam from its path. Um, and that's got two bits. First one is uh, called the Rayleigh scattering, and that's related to the molecules in the atmosphere. The second bit is uh, the Me scattering, uh, um, and that's related to things that are bigger than molecules. And we we'll, we'll generally call those things um, uh, aerosols. And we'll come back to all that in a, in a minute. But then there's the gaseous absorption component. Recall that the, uh, there is the absorption uh, interaction of the electromagnetic radiation um, we talked about previously. So we have the Rayleigh and Me scattering. Um, in Rayleigh scattering, you have incoming solar radiation. Uh, and when the atmospheric particles are much, much smaller than the wavelength of radiation, so like molecules, um, they will scatter uh, the radiation in a distribution that's sort of depicted uh, like in this picture here. The scattering at um, right angles to the direction of the incoming radiation is half the intensity to the forward and backward uh, directions. But generally, roughly speaking, there's an isotropic, there's an even distribution in the backwards and forward uh, directions of scattering, but it's very strongly related to um, the short wavelength radiations. So smaller wavelengths, for example, blue, are scattered much strongly, much stronger than uh, the longer wavelength of red. Uh, and this is the reason we have blue skies. Me scattering is related to the interaction of uh, radiation 
with particles that are much bigger or around this much bigger than molecules but around about the size of the actual wavelength of radiation uh, and me scattering is really um, uh, directional. Uh, it is strongly forward scattering, as depicted in this picture here, um, and that occurs over a broad wavelength, a broad range of wavelengths. And because it's a broad range of wavelengths, uh, or, or uniform across the um, blue to red regions of electromagnetic spectrum. That's why we get white, hazy halo, if you like, with all the glare around the sun. Uh, so the scattering of light through uh, the, the particles in the air that are of the order of the uh, magnitude of the uh, wavelengths of radiation, they will be broad uh, spectrum in scattering, leading to this white halo glare around the sun. It's the molecules that make the sky blue. So then if, if you've got the di direct beam, uh, you can think then about the reduction in intensity of that direct beam when it gets to the uh, Earth's surface uh, as uh, this first part of the equation here. That's what we've seen previously. But then because of you, your scattering of the direct beam in all directions, um, you get a, what they call a diffuse contribution to any observation here. So you don't just get that reduction in, in intensity at a, if you're an observer at the bottom of the atmosphere, you get the contribution from that scattering in all directions from molecules and aerosols. Aerosols are predominantly forward scattering. Um, remember that? And um, you'll uh, get that uh, halo effect. And so here, this, this uh, bottom graphic here uh, shows that halo effect. This, uh, makes everything lighter. So we've talked about the scattering component. There's also the absorption component of the optical depth. Um, when we look at the sun at the top of Earth's atmosphere, we observe these uh, so-called absorption features. These are the dark patches in the, in the electromagnetic spectrum here. These are the so-called Fraunhofer lines, and they correspond to the absorption of solar radiation uh, by those uh, molecules, those elements that are generated through the uh, nuclear synthesis process. Um, and so you have these uh, absorption features. Um, within the Earth's atmosphere, these absorption features are much broader. And so what we have here is, um, if you like, atmospheric absorption. Now remember, absorption is one minus the transmission. Uh, and so on the x-axis here, we have the wavelength and if you like, on the uh, uh, y-axis on this top graph, we have the amount of absorption um, by the atmosphere. And we can see here that combined effect of absorption and scattering having the biggest effect uh, for that, those very short wavelengths of radiation up to about a micron. And then from there on, it's, it's dominated by these uh, absorption features by various constituents of the atmosphere. So in the first instance, we can see that most of this uh, absorption, uh, the, these gray peaks, correspond to water vapor in the atmosphere. And by the time you leave the shortwave radiation and move into the thermal, so 10, 10 micron and above, um, you're uh, looking at uh, absorption features due to other constituents like carbon dioxide, uh, oxygen, methane, nitrous, uh, nitrous oxide, etc. So um, these various uh, gases in Earth's atmosphere, and we'll talk more about that tomorrow, um, are, uh, will, will result in a reduction of that being. So this is why that wavelength dependence is so important. Understanding the interaction of the electromagnetic radiation across the whole electromagnetic spectrum is important being able to understand or which parts of the spectrum are being affected by the atmospheric constituents, be them, particle, uh, uh, be them gases, be them molecules, uh, be they um, uh, aer uh, aerosols. Um, so there's spectral variation, but of course there's also the uh, diurnal variation, the variation over the course of a day. Um, and so what we have here is uh, just the measured at bottom of atmosphere 
solar irradiance at a location, I forget where, <laughs> um, and it's just monitoring the spectral irradiance uh, across multiple wavelengths. And so you can see here, we've got the 600, and, uh, this is about the, the red region of the electromagnetic spectrum, the green, uh, and this is going, uh, this is blue here, and then in 990, that's, that's into, uh, and 870, that's what we call in the near infrared region of the electromagnetic spectrum. And so um, there is a change in the uh, uh, shapes that correspond to the electromagnetic, uh, the, the wavelength of the electromagnetic radiation. But the important thing here is to note this uh, uh, cosine feature or this curved feature. Um, as the sun rises, uh, you can imagine it's uh, low in the horizon. Um, it has to travel through a lot more atmosphere to get to the observers. So there's a lot of deflection and absorption of that or, or reduction of the intensity of that radiation. But as you approach noon, the intensity is maximum. Um, and then uh, after noon, and then eventually by the time it's uh, sunset, that, uh, that intensity uh, reduces again as that sunlight has to go through more atmosphere. Um, the 940 nanometer wavelength band is also uh, what we call the water absorption feature. There's a very small, uh, compared to other parts of electromagnetic spectrum, um, uh, region that's affected by atmospheric water vapor. So I, th I think summing up, the important thing to remember is that the uh, solar radiation at the top of Earth's atmosphere looks a little bit like that. It's a little bit uh, crinklier than that because of the absorption of the um, uh, solar radiation by the uh, solar atmosphere itself. But effectively, um, once you take all the scattering that happens in our Earth's atmosphere away, there's a reduction of that curve uh, and then there's a further reduction of that curve by the absorption of various atmospheric gases. Um, and so th this is the, uh, the black body curve that we would expect at the bottom of Earth's atmosphere. And so uh, uh, the important thing here is to note that it corresponds to about 350 or uh, 0.35 uh, to about 3.6 microns. This is what's called the short wave region of the electromagnetic spectrum. So solar radiation enters Earth's atmosphere as shortwave radiation, but through absorption and emissions, uh, eventually it leaves Earth's atmosphere, land, ocean system as long wave radiation. And so from three and a half microns and higher, uh, these are all emissive channels. These are the, the emissive emission parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, and while our eyes see a very narrow wave, uh, range of wavelengths, there's a much greater short wave radiation, there's even a much larger long wave radiation component to the electromagnetic spectrum. And even through into the microwave, which is just off the chart here. But um, that's the, the, um, the uh, transmission through the atmosphere from short wave to long wave radiation as far as we're concerned in this course. So next up, we have to think about how is that energy partitioned into various uh, forms um, for use on Earth? And so there is the fundamental law of physics saying that uh, energy is conserved. So the energy in has to eventually, even time, equal the energy out. And you'll recall from our previous calculations uh, the top of atmosphere shortwave radiation is about 1.8 times 10 to the 17 watts uh, over the surface area of the Earth. The energy in uh, equals 341 watts per square meter. Now remember, this is half of the Earth that's illuminated by shortwave radiation, and it, all that all that radiation coming from the sun comes in the form of shortwave radiation. So it's lighting up on average half of the Earth. It has to leave the Earth somehow, and we've said that it leaves it as long wave radiation.